Hello, everybody, um, and welcome uh, to this very special event, um, crossing from wherever we happen to be to our colleagues and friends in uh, New York City who are attending and participating in the second meeting of state parties to the Treaty of the uh, Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And that treaty is our best way to get rid of our worst weapons. There's been action and activity in New York all week. Australia's been present with ICANN and wider civil society representatives with a formal Australian um, parliamentary observer. Um, this is a big issue. Obviously, we're high stakes. And today, we've got uh, great speakers and some real insights. Um, but before we go global, let's start local. Um, I'm Dave Sweeney. I work on nuclear issues with the Australian Conservation Foundation. I'm also a co-founder of ICANN. And I'm speaking to you today, and it's a great pleasure to MC today. I'm speaking from the lands of the Nagawal and Nam um, Nambri peoples in uh, Canberra. Um, and like uh, Aboriginal and First Nation uh, country right around this country, it was never ceded. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge all First Nations peoples, country and participants. Um, First Nations people here and overseas have been and continue to be disproportionately impacted by the impacts and the effects of the nuclear industry. And this week in Australia, we have seen the passing of a true legend and a true stalwart, a powerful voice for nuclear and Aboriginal reckon, recognition and justice. And as we gather to hear about moves to get rid of nuclear weapons, we mourn the passing of Mr. Kevin Buzzacott, a Rabana man, peacemaker, critic of nuclear and charter of a course to a better future. We celebrate his life. He passed earlier this week in Alice Springs. We commit to continuing and growing his efforts for a peaceful and nuclear free community of nations. And while we really miss uncle and very sad to see him go, we're also so lucky that we had so much of his head, heart and time on the journey. So Vale, Uncle Kev, solidarity and sympathy to all who knew him and to all who have lost loved ones on the journey. The TPNW, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, grew out of ICANN, which is an Australian initiative that was launched in 2007, and it was sharply focused on the need for a treaty to prohibit and abolish these indiscriminate weapons of mass murder. That treaty was realised in the United Nations in 2017, and ICANN received the Nobel Peace Prize in the same year. The treaty, the treaty entered into force in January 2021, and there's now over 90 signatory parties, and nuclear weapons are now formally and finally illegal in international law. And so from little things, big things really do can grow. They can and do grow. And today we're getting from New York City a growth update. A couple of little bits of housekeeping before we get underway. This uh, presentation and event is being recorded um, so that we can share it with people who are unable to join us and we can lift bits of excerpts to keep this story growing. Um, so just to advise you that it is being recorded. It is okay to have your video off. Um, it's not, uh, sometimes that's seen as a mark of, oh, you're not paying attention or disrespect, not at all. It's completely okay to have your video off. And we would urge that you be on mute um, because background noise, as we all know, can be a bit of a killer. Please use the chat for questions, any questions and comments, if you want to acknowledge the country you're on, or if you have questions or observations along the way. We are hoping to have time for uh, a QA and a at the end of today's session, and we will capture that as best we can. ICANN's Jamila Rushton is uh, Gunichamara land down on the south coast of Victoria, and she's assisting with that curation of that um, uh, chat, but we'll also be linking in the chat to resources and materials as we go along. So let's get underway 
great to see you, Susan Templeman, and welcome here. And five years ago, in uh, December 2018, the then Labor opposition committed at its national conference in Adelaide in a motion moved by now Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and seconded and spoken to by now Defence Minister Richard Miles, Labor moved and committed to consider key factors and progress signature and ratification of the TPNW in government. This August, in government at Labor's National Conference in Brisbane, the party again committed and reaffirmed to this commitment. And Susan Templeman is joining us this evening for her, this morning for us, and it's a great pleasure to have you here, Susan. Thank you. Susan's a federal member for the electorate of Macquarie. That's in beautiful country of the Blue Mountains in the Hawkesbury region of New South Wales. Uh, Susan is the official Australian Government Observer at MSP2 this week, and you were also the Australian Government Observer at MSP1 in Vienna last year. And I suppose if we could kick off tonight or today, and if you could tell us about your impressions of this uh, process this week, how that's been as, as a formal observer, and also how Australia is engaging with the Vienna Action Plan and advancing the government's commitment to sign the treaty. Thanks, Dave, and it is fantastic to be with you here. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which everybody is gathering, uh, including those of my own electorate, the Darug, the Gundungurra and the Darkenjung, uh, who have cared for that land so well. And I think that in a lot of ways is being um, replicated here with an incredible representation of First Nations peoples. Uh, talking about the impacts of colonisation and nuclear uh, abuse of their lands. Um, so it, the, the theme of First Nations, as it was in Vienna, is very strong here. Uh, and Karina Lester, who you will obviously be speaking and hearing from soon, uh, did an extraordinary job in uh, sharing in a very personal way the impacts that uh, Australian First Nations have experienced. Um, uh, so, Karina, I take my hat off to you. She's sitting just, just behind the computer so I can eyeball her. Um, okay, so, you know, it's not over. This This is not over yet. We still have another day to go, but I'll give you my impressions as I've had them from these first four days. Um, uh, from what we can see it looks like I'm the only parliamentarian as an observer state other parliamentarians have been here but mainly because their own country has not sent uh, anyone to officially observe so I'm a bit unique in that way and uh, it's a real privilege to have been able to be at the first meeting and also at this one and and that shows you the seriousness with which uh, we're working through the processes that we need to for the TPNW at a government level. Um, I think what I want to share with you is how how it feels. Last time was an incredible event that celebrated the work started by ICANN and uh, you know such hard work over many years to deliver the the ratification of the treaty. And um, it felt like a party. I have to say, <laughs> when I compare it to this one, um, which is not to say there isn't a huge amount of goodwill and good humour and positivity in this one as well, because there is, but there's also a really incredible, um, very uh, efficient working through things. And what it's showing is the amount of work that has been done in the intersessional meetings. And so a lot of things we walked away with last time, in my head, I was going, okay, that's great. That sounds great in theory. And I wonder how that's going to work through. And an enormous amount of work has been done. Uh, and I met with the the uh, president of the, the session today to congratulate him on Mexico's leadership to, to um, achieve what's been worked through. I mean, I think it's pretty impressive. I think they're on time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if anyone else yeah. has noticed that, but we're actually, things are running on time. The, the, there is really detailed input from states, parties uh, and civil society. 
And I think that's the a second takeout for me is there's still a really strong connection to civil society. It hasn't, that hasn't been lost in this transition from the very first meeting to the, the sort of business, more business-like ones. Um, so that's two impressions I have. Uh, the other thing I think is obvious to me is the amount of work that's been do done on, on some really key issues for Australia complementarity and how it fits with other treaties um, that we we have uh, signed uh, and I can see that there's been a lot of work done on that I can see work done on verification and some really fascinating discussions about the sorts of things you would use for verification which go a bit outside just counting the number of warheads uh, and uh, again that's happening in other treaties as well but I thought it was an exceptionally um, good discussion that took place on the floor. I think that was yesterday, might have been the day before. <laughs> um, and then the third thing is obviously universality. And, and what I've um, discussed with people around that, there, there's been a, a bit of a theme coming through that universal, universality is yes about how many states sign and but it's also about states moving from wherever they are now to the next step along so moving from not even engaging to being observers or first engaging and then being observers and a real desire to see each of those categories grow so that you've got a flow through of of countries um, engaging and moving closer towards being able to sign and, and then ratify. Uh, I think, the look, the last thing I think I'll say, because I could talk about it for the whole time, uh, is I think it's important to reiterate what has been said constantly to me, and I've heard it said to Germany as well, uh, who are also officially observing, and that is gratitude that we are doing that. Uh, there's enormous goodwill and there's enormous respect for uh, the position that observer states are taking. And I think particularly because we've chosen, you know, the, the foreign minister has chosen to have uh, me here as a, an elected member of parliament rather than leaving it to our um, New York uh, delegation, you know, permanent delegation here. And just the sense that... Uh, that they people want to engage with us and we clearly want to engage with the state's parties. So there's many things I will take back home, including thinking about uh, is there a contribution that we can be making, particularly on humanitarian and environmental aspects of the treaty, even though we're, we're not yet signatories? Is there a pathway there? And what would that look like? So I'm taking home lots of questions, but but I can really see um, incredible work has been done. And I, I'm very upfront in saying I'll be advocating back home. Here, my role is to be very clear about uh, what Australia's um, current position is. But at the same time, as a member of parliament, I have a, a personal interest and I will be uh, taking that back to Australia and working with my colleagues and with ICANN. Susan, that is... That is really, really good. That is really positive. Thanks so much. It's so good you're there. We're very pleased the Australian government has a formal observer. We'll be even more pleased and the corks will come out of the bottle when there's a signature. But this is an important part of that process and it's great. And really pleasing to hear both your enthusiasm and commitment to, to prosecute this at home and, and to see that recognition of work um, that is being done that can help inform Labor's uh, the Labor government's thinking around those considerations that you have. Um, we believe they're, they're there and being answered, but to see them advanced and for you to be able to formally witness that through the intercessionals is great. I know you can't preempt too much, but what sort of things do you think we could uh, expect to see in season 24 from the Albanese Labor government, Susan? Yeah, look, and I can't preempt anything, <laughs> but, but what I can highlight is that we have an enormous opportunity, and I've, I've said this before, um, in terms of our South Pacific neighbours. Uh, I've been having discussions with them, um, side discussions with them throughout the, the last four days. Um, and, and look, it was also, can I say, fantastic to sit down with Melissa Park as well uh, and have a really, I think we went way over time that we were meant to have. Uh, 
but talking with the South Pacific uh, and New Zealand uh, around how what you know how does this fit and it does fit um, really well with the sorts of care and concern we have in rebuilding that relationship and having a genuine deep relationship with our neighbours. So uh, we'll we will have to wait and see. That is, um, that's really heartening. At least the first part of that is enormously heartening, that regional awareness and the growth of this treaty in our region and for Australia to want to align and, and, and grow into that is, is really heartening. Um, you also mentioned how significant First Nations story and, and representation has been in this conference and in this wider process um, and a positive thing that the government committed to at your national conference in Brisbane was elevating some attention and some consideration around efforts around recognition and repair for affected communities that have been impacted um, in uh, in Australia, in this case, by nuclear testing and nuclear legacies. Um, I'm wondering also, is that an area where you'd hope to see some movement? Yeah, and I feel like I'm probably preaching to the converted in this group, but um, there is there is clearly work that can be done and uh, I think also really importantly, there's education that needs to be done because I'm not, you know, I'm I'm of a generation uh, where these issues were, I think, higher on the broad populace's agenda perhaps than now. We we weren't tackling climate change. We had the ozone layer back then, but but we had Chernobyl and nuclear things, and that led into nuclear war. Um, uh, tensions and so I wonder if my generation in those of us above 60 are um, assuming a knowledge that perhaps hey, other generations really good, have you? <laughs> broadly have uh, so I think there's a, a, a lot to be done and what I think we have to be careful of is that we're not asking First Nations people to be doing all the work on that you know this is a story we should all be sharing and it shouldn't be fall on the shoulders of those who are most affected by it uh, to be the lone storytellers on it. So um, that's just another area where I, ca I can't predict anything, but it's certainly an area that, that I want to think through and work through. And Jem's looking at a watch, so I really think we're going to have mm. to move on to the we, next we, we, <laughs> We're going to run we, out of time. <laughs> we will, uh, but I, I just want to finish, um, Susan, by saying that in the chat there's uh, comments that we love your enthusiasm. And we do. We really welcome that you're there in, in that formal capacity. We really welcome that you're bringing those insights and that commitment and that advocacy back home. We understand this is serious business and needs to be prosecuted. And we look forward to working constructively with you to step that forward. But just thanks for what you've done. Thanks for what you will do and have a safe return. Thank you. And look, I'm only here because this is important to uh, the foreign minister and the prime minister. And I, I don't think that should should be forgotten, that this isn't just because I'm keen to be here. This is because there is a genuine, uh, you know, a genuine belief that we have a, a role to play here and that we will keep exploring that. Uh, so I think that's, um, uh, you know, you, you would never have seen this under any other uh, government. Um, so I, I don't think we should forget that. We're, we're not forgetting it's front of mind and that also that, that clear commitment to sign is front of mind and, and we look forward to working and, and advancing that and we acknowledge that and thank you very much, Susan. And I will exit and let, let the next person slip in. Great Absolutely. to see you. Good luck and thanks very much. And the next person is a beautiful flow on from what Susan was saying about um, First Nations stories and impacts. Um, Karina Lester is a Yunkan Jachara Anangur woman from Northern South Australia. APY lands up near the uh, territory border. And Karina was raised in the shadow of British nuclear testing, which commenced on mainland Australia 70 years ago this year with bombs on Karina's traditional lands at Emu Field. A long history of family activism and advocacy with the Lesters, including through her late father, Yami Lester. Yami lost his sight, but he never lost his vision for a nuclear-free future. He lost his sight through the test, but he never lost his vision for a desire and for work to get rid of these weapons. Karina is an ICANN 
ambassador. Earlier this week, as Susan referenced, she gave a powerful testimony to the MSP. Karina, great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. And can you tell us about the week and about that presentation that you made? Yes. Good morning, everybody back home on beautiful Australian country. And, you know, I want to acknowledge all the mob that are back home because I'm certainly missing home. It's very cold here, um, which is wonderful. <laughs> A nice experience, but it's lovely to get home. Um, it has been a solid couple of days, really, to, you know, again, relive some of the stories. And, you know, I think it's something that did come out from the discussion around the impacts felt by Indigenous peoples, um, not only back home in Australia, but, of course, around the globe as well. Um, so it was really important. And I was very lucky to have been invited by the Mexican presidency to be involved on that panel. I was myself and, and there was one other delegate from um, Christmas Island who had the opportunity to be part of this panel that was full of a lot of scientists. Um, but we certainly made it clear that our stories are from those lived experiences and that was really important for scientists to hear as well um, and really important for us to have that opportunity to really present the stories. One of the big things that came out um, from that discussion was around how the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was going to be sort of recognised within the TPNW as well. And it's certainly something that has got me thinking, and I've been thinking about this previously before coming to New York as well, on how we actually need to be making sure when we are looking at Articles 6 and 7, that we are hearing those voices of Indigenous peoples, not only back home in Australia, but across the globe as well. So that was also supported by Patouche, who some of you may know, who's been quite vocal about the impacts on Indigenous peoples and our rights as Indigenous peoples and how they continue to be not heard by you know, powers to be or governments in play. So that was one of the strong messages that I gathered from that. Um, lots of networking and hearing as well of the stories. And this afternoon we had a um, survivors and affected communities gathering as well, which was really important. And one of the key messages from that gathering was the fact that there needs to be more of this opportunity to really get our communities, those who are survivors and those who are from affected communities to be in the same space, to be sharing, to be hearing, supporting one another um, and to nurture one another as well because of the stories are so real and, and at times very painful as well. So it was something that we were grateful to have that opportunity this afternoon from the event Peace Boat had hosted. And it was even better that we had one of the co-chairs from uh, Articles 6 and 7, Ambassador uh, Shodi, I think it was, who joined us, who actually heard from survivors and impacted communities firsthand then of how people really those who are from, whether they're from the Pacific region, whether they're Habakusha from Japan, from Australia, from Korea, um, from the, all the Pacific Islands, Fiji and Marshall Islands as well, um, that we needed to create that safe space for those testimonies and those stories. But he also made that time available to come and hear that. Um, and that was really important one of those key messages was the need for us to continue to have some gatherings held in the near future with just survivors and impacted communities or affected communities to be able to share and to learn, but also to work towards, you know, some real positive outcomes for those two articles. Um, we really want to try and make sure that because Australia hasn't signed on this, it doesn't stop from us as Indigenous peoples to push 
the things that need to be done now. And I know that I've certainly raised it with key people and even at my state level in South Australia around a cleanup of emu field. That is something that is really important to Indigenous peoples and to Aranojura who are part of that area there. And we know that that country is scarred and Australia need to be hearing those voices. So I think I'm really keen to keep pushing and keep talking up about the important needs of working through with First Nations people about the things that need to be done, um, not waiting on Australia to sign and ratify the treaty, but really to look at those important issues, have the opportunity to hear the issues around victim assistance and what can be done in that space as well and what Australia, you know, can do for First Nations peoples back home as well. I think we need to be thinking very carefully. And one of the other big things that did come out of Tuesday's session was also the fact that Indigenous peoples are bombed on or tested on, they mine on our traditional lands and dear Uncle Kevin was a big advocate for that, who really led the pathway and the foundations for us younger generation to talk up strong for country and to look after our country and not to mine on our traditional lands. Um, and so that's, you know, an ongoing worry that we have as First Nations. Um, also the waste dump issue as well. It's the nuclear colonisation and it's a big issue for us who are First Nations peoples who deal with these pressures and these, you know, governments and industries that constantly pressure us to be the solutions of their muck-ups and their pressures. So, you know, if there's something you can take from this morning's discussion is the fact that, you know, we First Nations do need to be sitting around the table. We need to be involved in the conversations um, and that we will continue because that came out of the session this afternoon that there's a lot of hurt and pain, there's a lot of anger, but we also need to be sitting in those spaces and around those tables to be the solutions as we go forward. And this treaty is one way and one means for us to be really pushing hard for that victim assistance and that environmental remediation. So that's pretty much New York in a nutshell from an animal perspective and from a First Nations person from Australia, but it was well represented by many others who came from the Pacific regions and came from Japan and came from other areas as well who had been impacted and who were survivors as well. So thank you all this morning for um, joining this little session as well. Karina. Oh, yeah, indeed, Karina, that's um, uh, fantastic. That is a fantastic nutshell. It is distilled, it is wise, it is humane, it's great. And um, we just want to really thank you. For, like, it's a long way to haul from, you know, APY lands, to, from APY to NYC is a fair ask. And you've done that and you've done it multiple times and you've been and remained this powerful advocate I also, I really want to thank you. I know everyone on this call would want to thank you on this Zoom and there's many organisations that would look forward to working with you next year to advance those things that will make a real difference in people's lives, those repair and recognition, remediation sort of works that are the steps. They're really important in themselves, but they're also steps to get us to the bigger final goal. I also want to really acknowledge with the passing of uncle and others um that mantle for that story the first nation story and the lived experience story which is so important and intertwined here it then gets a little bit heavier on the next gen the next gen steps up then as the older ones you're not quite the older one but you're a, you're a growing elder and you're a strong and powerful and recognized and deeply respected voice and we thank you so much that you use it so powerfully thank you <laughs> Hard act to follow Karina Lester, but we have someone following Karina Lester. By the way, um, Jamila has put a link to Karina's presentation 
to the committee um, in the chat, and it is uh, a beautiful distilled bit of lived experience and wisdom. So if you can if you can check that one out, that would be great. Joining us now is um, one who's got a, a keen eye on the regional dimension of this, Muhadi Sogiono. Muhadi is a senior academic and lecturer. He's ICANN's Indonesian partner. He's a former head of the Centre for Security and Peace Studies at Jogjakarta, and he has a CV that has more lines than we have time. But enough to say he's deeply connected. He's followed these issues and regional issues for a very long time and very closely. And Muhadi, it's really good. And we really appreciate you making the time to join us uh, today. And I understand there have been very significant and exciting developments in your homeland of Indonesia recently. And can you tell us some of them, please? You're on mute. You're muted, muted Mahadi. I've done that. No, sorry. Okay, good morning back then in Australia. So I am really very, very happy uh, to inform you that uh, Indonesia has uh, now uh, only one step more uh, as a uh, state party uh, to the NPT, uh, to the TPNW. So uh, this has been the, a product of uh, six years uh, effort uh, to persuade the Indonesian government and the parliament to support the TPNW. Uh, persuading the government uh, was not a, a difficult task because the government has signed the RAT, uh, TPNW since uh, 2017, uh, among the first uh, country to sign the TPNW. But uh, encouraging the parliamentary member to support is another thing. So uh, we we did it uh, finally uh, from early this year when I was invited to the parliamentary hearing to explain to view to uh, to express our view about uh, the need for Indonesia to uh, sign uh, and ratify the TPNW. So uh, this come almost in time yeah uh, because uh, we hope actually that uh, indonesia could uh, deposit the instrument of ratification uh, before uh, the second msp but unfortunately the uh, uh, administrative process need more times but my impression uh, during the course of uh, my in, in engagement in this process was that there has been a significant progress that has been achieved for example, uh, in comparison to the first uh, meeting of the state party uh, in the second uh, meeting of the state party, we have seen so many uh, concrete action and effort has been made uh, by previous speaker. We, we have heard about the uh, discussion about victim, victim assistance and remediation, as well as the appointment of the scientific ad, ad, advisory board who give us also a very significant uh, uh, contribution to, in terms of uh, bringing new knowledge that have been uh, actually developed during the process of uh, implementation of the TPNW. And the second impression that I had was that uh, while in the previous meeting we talked a lot about the issue of complementarity so it seems that uh, the complementarity between tpnw and other treaty seems to be uh, able to be taken for granted now uh, and this has been uh, strongly indicated by the fact that uh, the uh, observer countries uh, would like to engage with the uh, state parties of the and uh, TPNW is a very good indication. And when they engage with the 
said party members, they do not talk any longer about uh, or, or questioning any longer about the compatibility between the TPNW and NPT, for example, but they would like to express their uh, willingness to engage with the MSP, uh, with the uh, state parties. So this is a very, very good development, which I think uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, when we talk with uh, the Australian uh, government representative, they always argue against the TPNW because of the issue of complementarity between TPNW and other treaties. But uh, in this room now, uh, it does not seem to be a big problem. And uh, it is a, a small observation that I had was that uh, some uh, observed countries uh, with will not possibly uh, to uh, sign or ratify the TPNW. They have to justify why they could not uh, join the TPNW. For example, they are part of the NATO, commitment with NATO, and so on and so on. So uh, the changing of the discourse in disarmament uh, has taken place with the TPNW, and it has a very uh, a uh, significant impact that we can see here in the in the uh, meeting. This is very good uh, development. And now with the Indonesian ratification, you can uh, imagine uh, more than uh, two uh, two hundred seventy million has been added under the protection of the TPNW. So this is a significant number. <laughs> It is a very significant number, Muhadi, and that is a fantastic and positive report. Thanks to you and to your colleagues for your patient and effective advocacy. It's very important. We're very excited in Australia about this. Indonesia is populous. It's influential. It's important in the region. It's important reflector for Australia, and it's important in the non-aligned movement. So we very much welcome this and see it as a really significant step. Thank you for your work in making it possible. And just one final question. It's hard, I know, to preempt and all that, but have you got any sense of when we might expect that final step to be taken? Uh the final step is only a more administrative thing. So uh, I think uh, been signed by the uh, Speaker of the Parliament, then the uh, legislation will be sent to the President and the President will uh, put it in the uh, State Archive and then that's it. So That is absolutely wonderful. And on the chat, people hopefully are saying by, by, by December, we should be able to uh, uh, deposit the instrument of ratification. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh. in December. <laughs> That is great. That is so good. We're actually ahead of you, only in one way. December today here, we need to catch up with you <laughs> on signing. We need to catch up with you on signing the treaty. Thanks so okay. much, Mahadi. That is so much. positive and great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, very good right. news. Very good news. And the good news and the great speakers and the updates continue. Thanks, Mahadi. Um, our next speaker is. Um, is Dimity Hawkins. Many of you will be very familiar with Dimity. She's a co-founder of ICANN. She's a PhD candidate who's studying and has a, and is deeply connected with uh, the nuclear story in the Pacific, deep personal as well as professional connections there. And she's a co-convener of the Nuclear Truth Project, which is doing very significant and important work in, in building the basis for how we prosecute our work. Um, Dimity presented in, over the course of this week to a significant forum in New York um, around Pacific concerns and Pacific action. And maybe, Dim, if you could start us off by, by telling us um, about that forum, your presentation and your sense of the week. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Dave. It's lovely to be with people back home. Um, missing you all. It is rather cold, as everyone else has said here. So we're, we're all a bit in shock. Um, the forum that I was speaking at was for the um, uh, Asia Pacific Leadership Network, and it was a forum on um, goodness Tuesday. <laughs> was it Tuesday? I, I can't even remember the day of the week at this point. It was a wonderful forum. It was a wonderful opportunity to talk with friends and colleagues from around the Pacific. So we had um, people from from uh, the Marshall Islands and. 
anyway, we were talking around a whole lot of things and we're looking at the South Pacific Nuclear Free Zones um, Conference, the Royal Tonga um, Conference, but we were also talking largely about the, the various issues that are faced, the legacy issues that still pervade these conversations that we're having even this week. Um, throughout the whole conference, we're hearing so much from affected communities, we're hearing so much from Pacifica in particular, um, about the ways in which the legacy issues of nuclear testing, the waste that was left behind, the contamination that continues, the intergenerational impacts, all of the things that that um, Karina has been saying as well, and certainly saw the impact that this, these kind of conversations have continued to have on um, on our representative Susan at this conference. It's been a really interesting process to watch those kind of conversations happening. And I'm really grateful to have been a part of some of those, certainly with the APLN network, um, who have who've been putting a lot of energy into looking at these issues again throughout the Pacific region. Um, and also through um, some of the other panels that have been happening, there's been a myriad of panels. In fact, every day has been hard to know how to split your time running in and out of the rooms of the conference rooms to listen, but also running to these side events where there are so many great speakers doing such amazing work, but particularly the work around the lived experience around First Nations and affected community members, you know, really quite progressive and incredibly generous conversations, even whilst they're also quite traumatizing and heartbreaking at times for people to be recounting these stories over and over again. I think the thing that I, I am always struck by, and it's certainly been the case this week, is the amazing magic that happens when you get people together talking, um, and particularly for affected community members, to have space to talk to one another, to be given that kind of space to, um, to explore the commonalities between stories, and to also find the strength with one another to respond to the harms that have been that have been created through the nuclear age, to particularly to First Nations and marginalized communities around the world. Um, so that's been fascinating and um, incredibly humbling to listen to. I think the as Karina said, um, the forum this afternoon, the Survivors Forum, which was. Um, our friends at Peace Boat and ICANN and some of the Nuclear Truth Project had um, some effort into, but it was largely Peace Boat who brought this together and for which we're incredibly grateful. That forum this afternoon was transformative, watching the, the way the room came together, or the way the conversations uplifted each other, the way uh, the directions that came from affected community members so clearly, and to have an Ambassador Sito from Kiribati in that conversation at the end to hear directly from the people on the ground was really powerful. <clears throat> so it's been that kind of a week. I, I like anyone here, I could spend an hour just talking to you about the, the things we've heard, the things we've learned. It's been really wonderful. Well, I hope to be lucky enough to get that hour when you're back, but we haven't got it right now. And that was a beautiful little snapshot of it. Um, great efforts and activity and connection this week. Are you heartened with your work and, and the work around Pacific considerations to hear Susan Templeman um, making that connection very clearly earlier today? I, very much so. Very, very heartened to hear her speaking so of how impactful those voices have been um, for her um, and in those rooms, because you often wonder, you know, there's so much going on. There's over 50 events that have been on the calendar. Um, side events, as well as what's happening in the rooms themselves and the side meetings that are happening with scientific advisory group and other people like that. So there's so many things going on. So you so sometimes wonder, you know, is this a, a common feeling? But on this, I feel um, confident that these, these voices have made the world of difference as they always have in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It is the voices of survivors and the voices of affected communities who made that treaty happen. And they're still the ones who are bringing about the implementation in so many ways. Well said, Dim. And just finally, um, this week, uh, again, in Parliament, there was legislation in the National Parliament in Australia, there was legislation introduced to advance AUKUS in the Pacific frame that you're aware of. Um, to what extent is, uh, is AUKUS and concerns around AUKUS and Australia's positioning on this treaty and wider nuclear issues 
seen in your eyes and in your expertise as a as a bit of a litmus test of of Australia's relationship with the Pacific? Look, AUKUS actually has come up a lot, and and I've been really um I've been really surprised at at the analysis and the depth of the analysis that so many Pacifica have had when they've spoken to me about it. Um, I don't know how much it's been in the room because again, it's been a busy week. Um, but it certainly has been conveyed to me very clearly that AUKUS is a huge concern and it's really seen as a, a massive problem. Um, Recognising, you know, the Pacifica who I speak to uh, are often recognising, yes, there's a complex relationship here. Yes, Australia has a strong alliance with the United States and therefore this is, this is uh, you know, a major factor. Um, but I think it just goes to show that if Australia is really serious, that AUKUS has no uh, blockages for this treaty, then get on and sign it. Sign the treaty, get the si signature on the treaty. If AUKUS is not going to impact on uh, signing the treaty, then get on and sign it because it will build confidence in the region. And it's really important that we put this one to bed, as if, if that's at all possible. Important words and well said, Jim. Thanks for your time and your work in New York and um, have a good rest of your stay in the safe return. Thanks so much. See ya. We've got one final speaker, then we'll try and squeeze in a little bit of a uh, couple of questions before we wrap. Um, but this is just a joy to hear this. There's a sense of energy, enthusiasm, professionalism, positivity, loving it. Our final speaker is Jim Rommel. Um, Jim is the director of ICANN Australia, tireless and effective advocate. Um, I was walking around Parliament this week and everyone's saying, where's Jim? Um, so, <laughs> you know, noted in the corridors in Canberra and I'm sure you've made an impact in New York as well. We're really blessed in ICANN with the people who work, be it on the board or in the staff and, you know, people like Tim Wright who works on international treaty adoption and Jim Miller and, and uh, Jess Boylan and so many people, but Jim's work as the Australian Director is consistently engaging, consistently effective. Jim, thanks. And what do you see as some of the key takeaways from this week? And what can we expect like things like meeting statements and outcomes and next steps? Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. Wonderful to connect with you all. It's really lovely to be in the room sort of with you. Um, and we've got a very cute... Um, hotel room set up here uh, thanks to Mary from Peace Boat because the UN is closed at this time of night and you know space in New York City it comes at a premium so we're borrowing Mary's hotel room thank you Mary um, and anyway so to to get back to the meeting it has been four days down one to go it's um, it's been really massive last year's MSP was three days this one is five days and it I, Jamila was at the at the first one and it's it seems like that was kind of setting up a lot of the framework for the treaty and how the work gets done and then since that time which was only last June um, there has been a lot of work done and we're seeing this framework sort of be kicked into gear and I'm sure some some parts of the framework are a bit more active and you know have are, are more together than others um, but essentially there's the states parties and there are the working groups on different aspects of the treaty, these informal working groups, and they have um, chairs or co-chairs from different regions. And then there's also the scientific advisory group, which was just set up earlier this year. Um, so that framework will continue beyond uh, this meeting through to the next one in 2025. Um, and it's been really interesting to be in the room and listen and particularly to point out to Susan and the Australian delegation um, when the conversations are happening on those considerations in Labor's policy, because Labor's policy is we will sign and ratify after we take account of um, the, the need for complementarity of the ban treaty with the NPT, the need for an effective enforcement and verification architecture, the need for universalisation. And there are thematic debates on all of these issues and so it's been really good to point Susan to those and say you know make sure your your this the delegation is listening at that time and taking notes because it's really enlightening to hear about the research that's been happening and 
and other states' views on these issues because um, it's, it's you're getting out of the bubble of the Australian sort of defence establishment thinking, the arguments we usually hear from from DFAT or the Defence Department and from, you know, many parliamentarians as well, um, especially on, you know, the concept of nuclear deterrence. And it's in Australian government policy, this is a normal and accepted thing. But in the room of states parties to the TPNW, it's perilous, it's ridiculous, it's absurd, um, and it's a real barrier to actually moving forward on disarmament. So to just hear this room of people and government representatives as well as academics and scientists just shred the concept of nuclear deterrence mm -hmm. over and over again is is wonderful it's really heartening and um and i think really important for the observers in the room to to hear that so you know all of this has been really good the a central theme definitely has been articles six and seven and you've heard about that a bit already from from Dimity and from Karina um, but there's there are definitely things that we can recommend to Australia to take back. Um, Susan will be writing a report for the foreign minister and sending that back with recommendations in it. Um, you know that will be a private report but she'll also be reporting back to her colleagues in a more informal way and she's keen to um, do a parliamentary event you know early next year as well um otherwise you know tomorrow we've had all of the we've had panels we've had the general statements where sort of midway through the thematic discussions there's more on the agenda for that tomorrow for discussions on specific aspects of the treaty then there'll be a declaration adopted tomorrow a political declaration which has been drafted and worked on you know behind the scenes all week um so we look forward to seeing that and then the action plan from vienna which is really comprehensive that that carries through and the the working groups carry through so we can expect the the work to continue and um and for us, obviously, the work to continue back home to convince Australia and to, to get our government to do what they've said they'll do and to sign on to the treaty because we want them to be at the 2025 meeting of states parties um, at, at least as a signatory. Super. Good aim, clear date, and the crew to do it. So that's great. And pieces, it sounds very much from this uh, conversation this morning, lots of new and fresh and positive pieces to work with. Um, thanks for that, Jim. If you wouldn't mind staying in the chair, we've just got time for a couple of questions really before we have to wrap. And maybe if you could have the first cut at responding, if that sounds okay. And I'd remind people again that in the chat, there's a list and thank you, Jamila, for um, putting up links and resources and all sorts of connections there. There's a lot of stuff there that can be captured and looked at it with a little bit more time. Um, by people who are on the call. I'd also like to acknowledge John Hallam on the call who has done a lot of work over a lot of time on this issue of de-escalating nuclear threat. So thanks for joining us today, John, and for your efforts in general. Jim, one of the, um, one of the uh, questions was around, um, we've spoken about the meeting statement and some next outcomes and steps, so that's really good, but there's a question around international dimensions and two of those, one is... Um, has current conflict we've got two nuclear weapon states involved in live hot wars um, and particularly the conflict with israel and palestine um, we've seen nuclear weapons spoken about as a as a legitimate security or a legitimate defense response has this tension and these current concerns elevated calls for scrutiny of nuclear weapon states elevated a sense of urgency at the meeting Definitely. Um, that sense of urgency has come up a lot. A lot of delegations have referenced the conflicts around the world um, and, and said that basically this gives further urgent mandate to putting this treaty to work. I think um, most of the people in the room acknowledge that in terms of international agreements on nuclear weapons, this is the only one that seems like it's getting to work and that it's going anywhere. There's, you know, while countries like Australia want to 
put the NPT really at the centre of everything, um, there's clearly not, you know, that's it's quite, it's stalled, it's quite moribund at the moment. Um, and also a lot of countries have referenced Russia's de-ratification of the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty and that being really unfortunate. Um, you know, of course, the US hasn't ratified that either. Um, so they're just now on an equal par, but that's a step backwards. Um, so it's it definitely brings that brings the urgency to the fore. Indeed. Um, also on the international front, there's questions from Adrian, and Adrian represented Australia earlier at the uh, No Nukes Asia Forum in Korea this year, and thanks for that work and your advocacy, Adrian. But he, he's asked about in that regional context, um, are, are ASEAN nations or nations that are signatories to the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty, is there a sense of, of them increasingly coming on board with the TPNW? Can you please repeat that? We've got right. Mahadi, expert in the room for that one. Mahadi, um, it's just a, a, it's a quick, it's a quick response, Mahadi, to a detailed question. But the question is, um, do you see greater momentum around ASEAN or Southeast Asian nuclear free zone treaty member states towards joining the TPNW? Yeah, uh, currently uh, there are. Two, two more others, uh, two more countries who signed already the treaty but not yet ratified. That is uh, Brunei and Myanmar. And Myanmar uh, delayed the ratification because of the internal political problem. Uh, but Brunei, we are still trying to get uh, uh, this country on board. Uh, while one last country with is not yet uh, signing up and not uh, ratifying, as of course, uh, Singapore. So this is still uh, a, a very difficult uh, task to convince Singapore. Yesterday, I met with the uh, first secretary uh, of the uh, Singaporean he uh, permanent mission in New York, and uh, she tried to uh, justify why Singapore uh, hasn't joined the TPNW. And uh, she said that uh, yes, we 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 would like only to uh, ratify uh, the treaty that we can implement. So this is a quite uh, uh, interesting argument because uh, on on the one hand, uh, all uh, Southeast Asian uh, countries uh, have uh, ratified the. Southeast Asian uh, nuclear weapon free zones. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe that uh, TPNW is only logical uh, sequence, consequence of the uh, position that we adopted uh, under this uh, sun plan. Indeed. Thanks for that answer. That's good. And um, it, it does seem the next step in that long journey. And we've got our work to do, but we've got uh, bits to, well, we've got lots to do it with and lots to do it for. Folks, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a pity to say goodbye to this because this is a really good crew and I would love to make a cup of tea and sit back and really talk with people. But we are out of time. Our minute to, to midnight has arrived, but our collective <laughs> efforts will ensure that the scary global one does not. I want to thank the speakers today very much um, and, uh, and um, uh, for Susan, Karina, for Mahadi, for Dimity, uh, for Jem, um, really, really important, really good. Great to see you. Um, and um, I want to thank ACF and, and Rasko Antic for his efforts and promotion and support um, and the ICANN board and staff for their leadership and, and commitment and especially to Jamila for being a super um lifter at the back of house we've got plenty to do and there is plenty to do a couple of things we could do is acf and ICANN are currently driving a petition calling on the prime minister and the foreign minister to sign um the treaty we'll be delivering that in the first part of next year um, so if you could sign and spread that that all helps grow momentum there's an ICANN fundraiser at the moment with matching donations, a dollar from you as a dollar from someone else, which is $2 from ICANN to make a difference. If you can, um, you could, if you can support if possible, that'd be great. There will also be 
soon a summary of the MSP2, the highlights, um, some sense of next steps, some key resources on the ICAM web page. So keep an eye on that. For those who had questions or commentary in the chat that we didn't get to, my apologies. You know, it's a good sign when you run out because there's too much enthusiasm. And that's where we've got to now. I also need to thank Mary for providing a room that we could do this from. I love it. <laughs> good on you, Mary. I love that <laughs> practical. I love that practical international solidarity. Um, so thank you all. This has been really positive. It's been a joy to host this. And above all, thank you who have attended for your efforts. These are difficult days. They're troubled times. There's no doubt about it. And this is a heartening conversation, but it, it's against a global context of troubled times. So the preservation, the growth of our humour, hope, humanity is more important than ever. Your engagement helps build and grow this. And so we're moving. We're moving well. We need to move faster, but we're moving well. We're moving towards a treaty. We're going to get there and we're going to build a, a safer world. So thanks kindly to all. Good, safe travels. And if our New York friends can do us one favour, if you can walk hand in hand down Broadway, like the first ones on the moon, just to mark, just to mark that other master storyteller, Sean McGowan uh, from the Pogues, who passed today as well. So like, as we lose our stories in some way with Uncle Kev and and Sean, um, you know, we grow new stories and they're powerful and we've turned them from stories to a lived and positive reality. So travel safe, speak strong. Much love to all. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you. Yeah.